I never understood why humans like gold. It's got to be some kind of mass psychosis, this fascination with the shiny metal, and you'd better believe this is a $10 tungsten ring. But I suddenly have an interest in gold because, believe it or not, it might treat multiple sclerosis and was shown to reduce disability in a phase two randomized trial. What I'm referring to is a very unique and unusual pharmaceutical product, CNM AU8, that literally is is just gold, the metal in your jewelry, by a tiny pharmaceutical company, Clean Nano Medicine. This is different from any other pharmaceutical product ever developed. These literally are tiny gold nanoparticles in a suspension of water, but it's medical grade water, and they're clean surface self-formed nanocrystals, and gold apparently will naturally aggregate into certain shapes, such as hexagonal bipyramids pyramids, pentagonal, bipyramids, octahedrons, and tetrahedrons, and they're acting like microconductors within the cell, it's believed. These are extraordinarily small, only 68,000 or so gold atoms per nanocrystal, with a diameter of 13 nanometers or so. A nanometer is one millionth of a millimeter. These are extraordinarily small, and they can even enter the cell and distribute throughout the body. And it's given as an orally drinkable solution. And here is what it looks like, or at least one such particle under the electron microscope. You can see it forms a certain shape. And this is what the drug looks like. It's a black liquid. Perhaps if it becomes an FDA approved product, they'll have a fancy gold package. This looks somewhat unappetizing for the time being. As a brief aside, the same drug company is developing other nanoparticles, a zinc product thought to have antiviral, antimicrobial properties, a zinc and silver product used for infections and wound healing, and a gold and platinum product, which is supposed to have anti-cancer properties. Now, no one knows for sure how CNMAU8 could help with multiple sclerosis, but these are some theoretical mechanisms of actions. It's thought to act like a mini conductor, giving and receiving electrons, perhaps helping with chemical reactions, particularly in energy metabolism within the cell, both in the cytosol and the mitochondria. And it's well known that multiple sclerosis, particularly progressive MS, is associated with energy or mitochondria failure within the neuron, and it may help compensate for this energy failure. It also has some direct antioxidant effects, and it may stimulate oligodendrocytes or oligodendrocyte precursor cells to develop, differentiate, and even grow myelin. I note that these effects are extremely temporary as the drug is rapidly excreted into the bile and then the feces, so it must be given continuous if it is to have these metabolic effects. I won't bore you with organic chemistry, I include this just so future slides make some sense. Essentially, NADH is a form of stored energy within the cell, and this metabolic pathway glycolysis, where glucose is metabolized into pyruvate over 10 steps, generates two molecules of NADH. That energy can be released as NADH is converted back to NAD+, or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. So again, NADH is a form of stored energy. This is a basic science study of CNMAU8 in mesencephalic rat cultures, just in cell culture. And you can see different doses of CNMAU8, very dramatically different doses, all increased NAD plus by around 30% compared to vehicle, which is placebo. So essentially, it helped to release the energy of NADH, clearly showing some metabolic effect within the cell. This is a similar study in human cultured cells looking at ATP, adenosine triphosphate, again, a form of stored energy used for enzymatic reactions within the cell. Vehicle, the gray bars are placebo. We're looking at both mitochondrial ATP and glycolytic or in the cytosol in the rest of the cell ATP. And you can see the cell cultures given CNMAU8 at various doses seem to boost ATP or available energy. And you can see there's a threshold effect where beyond 100 nanograms per milliliter, there is no additional boost in ATP. Next, let's move to animal research. This is research in a rat model of multiple sclerosis. Of course, rats don't get
get MS. So what they did is they gave them a neurotoxin cuprazone, which induces demyelination, and then they gave them placebo vehicle in red, or they gave them CNM AU8. And they tried a few different things. They tried giving it ad lib. In other words, the rats could eat it themselves, and that didn't seem to be effective. And then they gave it by gavage, in other words, by tube feeding. Now, if you look to the left, you can see an example of a good result. You can see extensive demyelination in placebo, and you can see these nice, beautiful myelinated axons, remyelinated axons with gavage CNM AU8 given at week three. And they quantified this and they showed a difference. And you can see giving it early in week one was not very effective. And you can see in week three, it wasn't effective for many of the rats, but there seems to be a small subset where it induced remyelination. So again, this was giving it delayed at week three. They also looked at motor outcomes by fine motor kinematic analysis. This is an automated system that gives objective results. And you can see the sham in blue. They did not receive the neurotoxin Cooper zone. So of course they were stable. And you can see on the Y axis is the level of disability measured in distance from the control from the sham. The red line is the vehicle, the placebo. So they got Cooper zone. They had demyelination, but they received a placebo. And the green line is those rats that got CNM AU8. And you can see at week three, there was no difference. But by week six, you can see the green line starts to approach the sham control rats that were not even demyelinated in the first place. And they did achieve a statistically significant difference, p-value of 0.032. But YouTube analytics suggests that my audience is 0% rats and 100% humans. So does it even do anything in humans? Does it get into the cell, into the brain, and have these metabolic effects? Well, this is a study using MR spectroscopy on both multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease, repair MS and repair PD, and they combine the two studies for statistical power. And MR spectroscopy of the brain looks at metabolic activity and quantifies the ratio of NAD plus to NADH, and a higher ratio would mean more utilization of energy, and with natural aging, there's a decrease in the NAD plus to NADH ratio. Anyway, they combine the two data sets to create an N of 24 versus 24 at baseline, so this is a pre-post comparison, and they boosted the ratio by 10%. It was statistically significant with a p-value of 0.037. You could say they're cheating by combining these two diseases, but there is something going on here. It's almost like they're making the cells metabolically younger. And this reminds us that CNM AU8 isn't just being studied in MS, it's also being studied in Parkinson's disease and ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. In Parkinson's disease, the data is just the repair PD data I just showed you. Very preliminary in multiple sclerosis, we have a completed visionary MS phase two trial I'm about to show you. And in ALS, we're the furthest along along with the completed Healy ALS platform or phase three trial. This is a very interesting study where they didn't just compare one drug versus placebo. They looked at multiple potentially active agents and CNM AU8 showed some benefits in terms of survival. This is beyond the scope of this particular video. So we'll focus on MS and the core of this video, the meat of the video will be the results of the phase two visionary MS trial. This was a study in relapsing remitting MS, people with stable disease they had to have it, no relapses in the last six months, age 1855, and they had to have chronic vision problems due to MS. The reason for this is the primary outcome of the study was low contrast letter acuity, and they chose this because it's easy to measure a small difference, which is important for a trial with a small sample size and short follow-up, a preliminary trial. They looked at two different doses of CNM AU8, 15 milligrams and 30 milligrams daily compared to placebo. Now this is an add-on drug. More than 90% of people in the study were already taking disease-modifying therapies, and 53% were on the drugs Ocrevus, Tysabri, or Rituximab. So a lot of these people were treated with highly effective disease-modifying therapies, very good at stopping relapses and new MRI lesions, which really makes sense because this drug should work in a different way, not by suppressing the 
immune system. It should have these metabolic effects. Now, in a sense, this study was unsuccessful in that they didn't recruit their planned 150 patients. They could only recruit 73. The results are still impressive nonetheless, and apparently their poor recruitment was due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the timing of everything. Now, in addition to the primary outcome, they also looked at secondary outcomes, I'll explain in a moment, including the symbol digit modalities test, a measure of cognitive function, the nine hole peg test, a measure of upper extremity function, and the time 25 foot walk, a measure of lower extremity function. And the way they did the statistical analysis is they took the two doses of CNM AU8 and they put them together together against placebo for greater statistical power. This was specified in advance. They also used a p-value with a threshold lower than normal, so a p-value of only 0.1, and this is used for preliminary exploratory analyses. So take the results with a grain of salt. To further explain the outcomes of the study, this is the nine-hole peg test where you have to take tiny pegs and put them into small holes requiring good hand-eye coordination. They test both the dominant and non-dominant hand. This is the symbol digit modalities test, and they give you a key where a certain symbol is represented by a number, and then you have to memorize this, look at the symbol, and fill in the numbers and do it as quickly as possible. It's a measure of cognitive function, and it really tests processing speed, which can be affected in multiple sclerosis. This is the time 25-foot walk, where you simply walk 25 feet as quickly as possible. A healthy young person can do this in about four seconds. And this is the low-contrast letter acuity chart. And basically, it's not shown well in this slide, but these letters are a light gray, very difficult to see, and it's thought to be more sensitive sensitive to damage related to optic neuritis. And they test both the affected eye, the eye with worse vision, and the fellow eye, the eye that has better vision. And it's very good at picking up slight differences in visual acuity. These are the baseline characteristics of the participants, so we get a sense of who was in the study. Focus on the bottom line, all participants pooled. We can see the average age was 38.7, so relatively young. We can see that most were female, about 70% for whatever reason in the placebo group. It was a little bit imbalanced, 83% female. And 70% makes sense because about 70% of people with MS are female. For race, it was 95% white. So they didn't really get good recruitment of ethnic minorities, which limits the applicability of the study to different populations potentially. Average weight was about 80 kilograms. Average EDSS, expanded disability status score, a measure of disability in MS was only 1.75, so very low. So generally speaking, they had a very low level of disability. And they were early in the disease, only 5.5 years time from diagnosis. And the time since the last relapse was 49 months or around four years. So these are relatively young people with low disability who are earlier in their diagnosis and doing well with MS. And they still chose to enter a clinical trial. So you have to give these people a ton of credit. And now we'll move to the results. We'll start with visual evoke potentials. This is a test where electrodes are placed on the occipital scalp and a checkerboard pattern of lights is flashed into the eyes and an electrical potential is measured to record the function of the visual pathway. And they're looking at a change in amplitude from baseline. So compared to the visual evoke potentials done prior to the study, the green lines are people who received the drug in the affected eye and the fellow or better eye, and they did a little bit better, a little bit higher amplitude, whereas those getting placebo, the white lines did a little bit worse. So there is some difference in optic nerve function. This is the results of diffusion tensor imaging, a specialized sequence of MRI supposed to measure the integrity of the function of the axon. And they compared the results based on various other studies in multiple sclerosis, supposed to imply a favorable DTI result. To the right favors the drug, to the left favors placebo. They looked at various aspects of the brain, the cerebrum, cerebral white matter, normal appearing white matter known to be affected by multiple sclerosis, even though it appears normal on conventional MRI and the optic radiations. And you can see a clear trend towards a more favorable result with the drug compared to placebo. Of course, this is all a charade. What we really want to know is did people actually do better with the drug? 
about did it actually improve symptoms. We'll start with the primary outcome, low contrast letter acuity. Again, this is that eye chart with the faded gray letters. And you can see the change from baseline, the number of letters you could read at the end of the study versus the beginning. And you can see the placebo in the dashed white line. There's a little fluctuation, but they stayed about the same. Whereas with the drug, they gained about three extra letters on that eye chart, a modest but perhaps noticeable difference. Now the p-value is 0.056, which would not be statistically significant except for the fact that they said they were going for an exploratory p-value of 0.1, so they're allowed to claim victory. But much more impressive in my opinion were the results of the MS functional composite Overall, this is a chart looking at all of the outcomes, not just low contrast letter acuity in the affected eye, but also the fellow eye. The SDMT, a measure of cognitive function, the nine hole peg test, a measure of upper extremity function, the time 25 foot walk, you can see there's a clear shift to the right favoring the drug overall. The exception being the non-dominant hand nine hole peg test where the treatment group did slightly marginally worse. Everything else seems to favor the drug, although of course not always statistically significant. And you can see that if you look at people who improved by a meaningful amount in more than two MSFC domains, 45% improved with the drug versus only 29% versus placebo. This analysis was not statistically significantly different, but it would be quite clinically significant, 16% absolute difference in my opinion. However, if you convert everything to Z-scores, standard deviations from the mean compared to baseline, you can see those who got placebo they got slightly better by about 0.05 standard deviations. But in people getting the drug, and this is taking all of the MS functional composite, you can see they improved by more than 0.3 standard deviations, a total difference of 0.28. Very clinically significant, in my opinion, over only a 48-week period, and the p-value was approximately 0 0.02. So there may be something real here. Of course, I'll also mention the side effects. This drug has been reported to cause local lip irritation and sometimes gastrointestinal side effects. From the ALS trials, it looks pretty good. It looks fairly safe. These are the data from Visionary MS, the study I just discussed. Of course, many people report mild or insignificant adverse events, but focus on the severe adverse events. This row, you can see one person with a low dose, two people with a high dose, and two people with placebo reported severe adverse events. With placebo, one person had lentigo malignum melanoma, which is localized melanoma, skin cancer. One person got pregnant, which of course isn't an adverse event. You're just generally advised not to get pregnant while in an experimental drug trial. With a low dose of CNMAU8, one person had pneumonia and bacteremia, infection of the blood with staph aureus, and endocarditis infection of of the heart valve, a serious infection, although this is not thought to be an immunosuppressant, so it may be a fluke. With a higher dose, one person needed ketamine for pain treatment and had a prescription drug overdose. Another person had deep vein thrombosis or clot likely in the leg veins, although this was six months after stopping the drug, likely not related. So there's really no signal for any significant risk at least with these small sample sizes. In terms of ongoing research for this drug, we have the open label extension of the study I just showed you, Visionary MS. So we'll see how these people do long-term taking the drug, even though they're unblinded. The Repair MS study I showed you earlier was for relapsing MS. There's a second phase of this clinical trial for non-active progressive multiple sclerosis, again, looking at brain energy metabolites. And this has been funded partially by the National MS Society. And of course, in the future, we could have a large phase three trial and see if this drug really works or not. And I should give the caveat, particularly for drugs early in development, that a lot of these things don't actually pan out. We can be optimistic, but we really just don't know if it works or not. This is the price of the stock clean nanotherapeutics. And you can see it's actually down a lot, more than 90% from the peak. I'm not 
given stock picks here. I have no financial conflict of interest. I'm just showing this to make a point. I'm not sure why this is. Maybe people were unimpressed by the fact that they couldn't fully recruit their multiple sclerosis trial, but the market capitalization, the approximate value of the company is only 74 million. That's kind of low considering that even a single MS drug with wide adoption would probably be worth north of $500 million. So this may be somewhat of a long shot, or at least that's what the market thinks. But I think it's at least interesting, and I'd love to know what you think about this drug. Do you have any questions or suggestions for other videos?